Welcome to QuickBooks Connect. I'm here to kick things off. My name is Ed Ige, and I lead the accountant team at Intuit, a team of hundreds of people entirely focused on accounting professionals like you. I love the vibe of QuickBooks Connect. There's something really exciting. There's something really energetic and powerful in the air. I think it's a combination of people and ideas and optimism that just opens you up to new possibilities and new ways of thinking. Our theme this year at QuickBooks Connect is own the future. When I heard that, I thought, man, I wish I could get to the point, or I wish I was at the point where I felt mastery over my own future, but the reality is I, I am all consumed just focusing on the present. My present reality is this. Thank you, uh, and all the things that come with it. This is my first child, and the planner in me is really kicking into high gear. I'm trying to avoid a future where things like this happen on the regular, <laughs> which is a very real possibility in my house. <laughs> and instead, I really hope to work toward a future that's a little bit more controlled, something a little bit more like this. My hope in all this preparation, of course, is that my family and I feel a little less like this. It gets better. <laughs> and a little bit more like this. I know my future is not going to be exactly as I picture it, but knowing what I want it to be motivates me to get my act together in the present. In the professional world, there's rarely that same sense of, I don't know, giddy anticipation when thinking about the future. So often, the message is that the world is changing and we better catch up. Of course, the world is changing, but why should that be menacing? Why should that scare us? The implication is that accounting professionals are not adopting technology fast enough, that you're slow, that you're behind, that you're averse to change, that you will miss out, that you will lose. You know what I see? I see a profession that has not just weathered change for decades, but a profession that has led through change for decades when accounting moved to Windows, whether it was spreadsheets or software, you saw the power of systematic calculations and reporting. I mean, sure, if a hard drive went bust, you were in a world of hurt, but you saw the market demand and you adapted. When accounting moved from Windows to the cloud, this is the group that recognized the value in having near real-time books so that your clients could make better decisions. And now, we're in the era of artificial intelligence, and let me tell you, the data that I see shows that yet again, you're the trendsetters. You are the early adopters. You're the experimenters. You aren't just using artificial intelligence. No, you're paving the way for it to transform the industry. How do I know? Well, 90% of you have chosen to pay for your clients' books through the practice. Many of you are moving into value pricing, aligning your practice's incentive with driving efficiency in your operations. Don't tell me that accounting professionals are resistant to automation. When 90 per, when 10, when you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> when you connect financial institutions to your clients' books to automate the import of transactions at 10 times the rate of small businesses, when your clients have three times as many transactions that are automatically created versus manually entered versus those that don't have a pro, when you use rules at 10 times the rate to automate categorization and third-party apps at three times the rate to automate processes, when tens of thousands of you adopt brand new experiences that we announced on stage at this time last year like client overview and project profitability within days of launch and are now using those same experiences in the hundreds of thousands each month, from ensuring the books are complete to ensuring the books are accurate, to optimizing business operations, to extracting insights to make better business decisions across the board. This is the group 
leading the charge. I know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to the change agents. So change agents, let's talk. From the hundreds of conversations I have with accounting professionals like you every year, here's my takeaway. The world is changing. And you, accounting professionals around the world, you are changing the world. And you don't even have to take my word for it. Look inside. Isn't that why you're doing this in the first place? For the moments when you help your clients finally understand their business, when you can get past those feelings of guilt and shame that cloud money conversations, and through your guidance, get your clients to those moments of pride and that sense of accomplishment thanks to you and your expertise. Small businesses feel like the odds are stacked against them, and I know that every one of yours has a leg up. When clients work with an accounting professional, they are more financially stable, they are more creditworthy, and they are two times as likely to succeed. But not everyone has the advantage of the expertise you bring. At Intuit, our mission is to help small businesses prosper, and the primary way we help them do that is to connect them with an expert like you. QuickBooks has invested in this connection for years, and we're seeing results. Today, only three out of 10 small businesses in the United States are connected to an accounting expert. Through programs like Find a Pro Advisor, the largest matchmaking program for accounting professionals and prospective clients on the planet, among QuickBooks customers, six out of 10 are connected to a pro. So how do we grow even further? Well, we see two big challenges. The first is that there are way more people who need expert help than there are experts to support them. For every 500 new small businesses that get started, there is one accounting professional who enters the workforce. We need to scale to meet growing demand. And QuickBooks can help through compliance automation that increases your capacity. The second challenge is this. Most small businesses need help, but only a fraction are looking for the expert help that they need today. Within the QuickBooks ecosystem, we already have many customers connected to experts, over half, and we have nearly two million more to connect, so there is some opportunity there. But across the nation, 21 million small businesses need expert help and aren't searching for it today. We've worked for years to connect people to experts, and what we've learned is that many turn away from the search. They do recognize that they need help. Oh, they know it. And we know that an accounting professional could solve the problems that they're experiencing, but many are intimidated by the process to find one. When we nudge them to start looking, they tell us that they don't have the confidence to qualify an expert on their own. Our goal is to connect these small businesses with the expert pro advisors they need without the intimidation factor of a search. Our solution is software coupled with human expertise, your expertise. QuickBooks Live adds on-demand help from a bookkeeper, from a pro advisor to the QuickBooks subscription. For the industry, this could mean an unprecedented expansion in the number of people who have access to bookkeeping experts for the first time, an expansion to an entirely new segment of people who do not get the help they need today. And because participating in the service is open to pro advisors with bookkeeping expertise, it's also a way for us to extend your reach to our customers and prospects. I was speaking with Claire the other day. She's an advanced certified pro advisor who's in the audience and has no idea I'm calling her out. Um, and she shared with me that she chose to participate in QuickBooks Live for the new revenue, uh, uh, the new revenue source that it would bring, and also because of the flexible scheduling. But what she values most is access to a close-knit team of really high-caliber pro advisors that she can learn from. We just launched QuickBooks Live earlier this summer, and the offering will evolve as we learn more from our customers and as we learn from you, our partners. This is a two-sided network, and it's, in order for it to succeed, it's got to work for both our customers and our partners. There is no QuickBooks Live without the ProAdvisor community. To realize our vision and help more small businesses prosper, we are building an expert platform through QuickBooks where you can grow your practice and scale your impact. I've shared how you can grow your practice with services like Find a ProAdvisor and QuickBooks Live. This is also the place to scale, 
to build capacity to serve more clients as you grow and to deepen your impact, offering more to the clients that you have. I'd like to focus the rest of this conversation on scaling your impact. We talk to hundreds of experts a year, if not thousands, and recently we discovered something interesting. While on average you serve clients at a ratio of 25 to 1, some of you far exceed this ratio, and you aren't sacrificing time with your clients to do it. What we learned that you do differently is this. You take full advantage of the automation available in QuickBooks, and as a result, you have the capacity to support twice as many clients. So what's holding others back? I will tell you in a moment. It's not your interest or your willingness to try new technology. It's awareness, and there's no concrete measure of efficiency, making it really hard to know where you stand. I'm proud to introduce Optimization Center. Optimization Center gives you an objective measure of how effectively you've set up each one of your clients through an efficiency score. You'll also get a con concrete recommendations that will elevate you to best in class. Let's check it out. As always, when you log in to QuickBooks Online Accountant, you're going to start on your client list. You're soon going to notice a new column called Efficiency Score. For each of your clients, QuickBooks is going to scan all the transactions and identify what percent are highly efficient. And by highly efficient, we mean that you've minimized the amount of times you've had to tr touch the transaction through automation in order to get it entered, categorized, and reconciled. When you click on the efficiency score, you're going to be taken to the optimization center in your client's books. And here, you're going to get a breakdown of that score across three key areas for this client, across bank accounts, expense tracking, and income tracking. Each section offers specifics on what contributes to your score and what you can do differently to improve it for this client. Let's go ahead and click on bank accounts. At the top, you see an efficiency score for how bank transactions are handled. The transactions that count toward your score are those that are recorded automatically from a bank connection and categorized accurately, either through a rule that you create or through a QuickBooks recommended category that you confirm. Right below, the table gives you a really detailed breakdown highlighting the areas with rooms to improve and suggested actions. For example, for this particular client, you can see that all the transactions are coming in from a bank connection, which is awesome. That means you're not going to have to manually enter those transactions, no need to upload them. And when it's time to reconcile, these transactions are pretty much handled for you, so you're not going to have to worry about them. But next is not great news. You see that rules haven't been set up, and you need to manually categorize about half of the transactions coming in. That's super inefficient. Uh, and you'll see that QuickBooks recommends that you add some specific rules that we're suggesting for you in order for you to optimize this and just take care of it automatically on an ongoing basis, which is a best practice, eliminating the need for you to manually code those transactions each month. For those already on board with this best practice, the Optimization Center allows you to copy rules across your clients. Thank you. To do this, just choose Use Existing Rules, select the clients you want to copy the rules from. Somebody is really happy about this. It's so awesome. I'm happy about it too. And just like that, you can bring over the rules that you've chosen to the client that you're working on. So the time that you spend investing in making one of those clients efficient can carry over to all your clients too. On the expense tracking tab, you're going to see how Receipt Capture can automate the expense, uh, expense entry. So basically with Receipt Capture, it's a feature that your clients can use on the go or in the office to capture and read receipts. Many of you are using it today. I don't have time to dig into all the really cool features that we built into Receipt Capture as a result of your feedback, but there is one thing I want to share. To the people in this room, for the first time ever, I'm so excited to share with you that soon you won't just be able to take a picture of receipts and extract data from them, but you'll also be able to do the same for bills. Just take a picture or upload it into QuickBooks and we'll read it and create a bill in QuickBooks just as we do for receipts. 
With the optimization center, you're going to get really deep visibility and control over your level of automation. You're going to get the tools you need to increase efficiency across your clients too. We see top accountants get an efficiency score of over 80, and I'm just going to lay down a challenge right now. If you get a score over 90, you need to tweet that to me. That's serious bragging rights. You guys up for the challenge? All right. When doing monthly bookkeeping work, I know it's not all about efficiency. You take a ton of pride in getting your work done right and getting the books done right. You pour hours into finding and fixing mistakes with layers of reviews. Well, we have a new experience in QuickBooks that's just for experts where you can get to high quality books in a fraction of the time, giving you best in class workflows to follow and detecting hard to find anomalies for you. We call it bookkeeping review. Let's check it out. From your client's books, you're going to click accountant tools at the top and choose bookkeeping review. Bookkeeping review sets a four-step process, and I'm going to walk you through each one of them. The first step is making sure that you've got all the data that you need. QuickBooks has already scanned all the transactions from last month, and it found a set of them that are missing some data. You can see just a few examples of the anomalies that Bookkeeping Review is going to detect for you, such as expenses with no vendor and a check without a payee. This automation frees you up from having to discover these anomalies on your own. Now, some clients are going to have unique review needs, and that's cool. We, we know that not everything can be fully automated, so we added a custom checklist at the bottom for items that you add, and they're going to show up every month, giving you the flexibility that you need to track all the things that are unique by client. We're also going to head over to Resolve Common Issues. Resolve Common Issues, again, scans all transactions, but it's looking for something different. At this point, it's looking to surface potential errors that are important for you to address before you reconcile. These are errors like changes to a prior period, duplicate transactions, miscategorized transactions, even unusual balances, undeposited funds, and aging transactions. This is what Bookkeeping Review does. It finds errors automatically so you don't have to go hunting for them. It brings them to the forefront so that you can address them really quickly. And with your input, we can leverage advanced data techniques to quickly expand this to even more areas requiring anomaly detection. So I'm counting on you to tell us what you think and what you want to see next. Next, we're going to head over to the Reconcile tab. Here you get a, a details for each of the accounts, including the number, including the number of unreconciled transactions the date since lax reconciliation, and even the statement directly from the financial institution that you've already connected to QuickBooks with no additional work. I know, I know, it's so cool. With no additional work from you or from your client. Statement auto import is now live in Canada with over 70% coverage. And in the United States, we're live to thousands of people who have early access to this feature. We're working with large financial institutions to expand our U.S. coverage and make this available to you this spring. <laughs> Final review helps you do one last pass. It automatically generates reports for the periods that you're working on, so you can quickly do a spot check and just be confident that the books are perfect. Bookkeeping review enables you to get complete and accurate books in a fraction of the time. And Optimization Hub and Bookkeeping Review are just a couple of examples of how we help you scale. What do you think so far? We've got engineers, product managers, designers, data scientists in here right now that are building these for you, and I know your energy means a ton to them, so thank you. Um, next, what I'd like to do is help is share a little bit about how we're helping you increase the depth of your impact. Only half of small businesses survive their first five years, and with you by their side, their odds of success double. Your impact can be transformative. So we're investing in ways to help you get an even stronger influence over your client's success. I'd like to show you just the start of that journey with business performance overview. It's 
a beautiful data experience that'll spark conversations between you and your clients on improving their business outcomes. Let's dive into a real world example. Let's say you just finished up on your client's books. Let's talk about Natalie's wraps and salads. So now you're, you want to review the state of her business so that you can prepare for a meeting that you have with Natalie later on in the week. You jump into her books and click over to the brand new business performance overview within the overview tab. Just like all of the experiences I've shown you today, this is only available through the expert platform to pro advisors like you. We start with key metrics. Here you can stay on top of P&L KPIs, and we show you the delta between the current period and the comparison period that you choose. In this case, Natalie's income grew 13% month over month, but her COGS grew disproportionately at 27%. In your last conversation with Natalie, she shared that she changed produce vendors so that she could go all organic, which could be driving this, but you'll want to get a full picture. So let's go ahead and check out trends. Here you can see how the performance has changed over the past 12 months and compared to prior year. We're starting with gross profit margin, net profit margin, income and expenses, accounts receivable and accounts payable days, which directly impact your client's cash flow, as well as quick and current ratios to understand business liquidity. Now, thank you. Now, in Natalie's case, it looks like the increase in COGS is having a significant impact on her gross profit margin, which is an area that you'll want to dig into deeper as you have your conversation with her. Considering Natalie just moved to organic produce, you might want to make sure that she's adjusting her prices accordingly. But unless you have specific niche experience, you may not have the comparisons you need to know if asking her to sustain a certain gross profit margin is even reasonable. And today, there's really no reliable place to get those industry benchmarks for small businesses. And it can take years to develop the expertise if you do focus on a niche. QuickBooks is using the aggregate, anonymized data of millions of small businesses to deliver industry comparisons to you. Just turn on industry comparisons, and you'll see how this client is doing relative to other businesses like them. Now, the information you need to give your clients a leg up, it's right in your hands. You get the median for the same business type with comparable revenue and within proximity. Now, back to Natalie, it looks like the industry comparison is at 65%. So she used to be overperforming over against the benchmark, and she's now off target. With this knowledge, you can craft a plan together of how to get back to healthy levels. And that's business performance overview. QuickBooks brings you a beautiful data experience with key metrics, trends, and industry comparisons. You get a deeper understanding of your client's business, a necessary foundation to help them grow. So I've shown you how QuickBooks is leveraging artificial intelligence, automation, and the power of many small businesses for the prosperity of every one of your clients. Now I'd like to invite you to innovate with us. Sure, we build these experiences, but make no mistake, you shape them. In every experience we build for experts, you're going to find a feedback link. Tell us what you like, tell us what you don't, and please help the profession by telling us what you want to see next. These messages go directly to our engineers, designers, product managers, data scientists, and leaders across the organization pop in to watch these feeds on the regular too. We all learn from them. I have to say, I start and end just about every day by reading through fresh feedback. Our team reads every single submission, and what we read shapes how we think about the problems we're solving and what we do next. I can't wait to get these experiences in your hands. Business Performance Overview is live to everyone right now. And today, we're opening early access to Optimization Center and bookkeeping review, as well as industry comparisons. People, this is the time to take out your phones. I'm going to do the same. <laughs>
I'm about to show you a link, and through this link, you're gonna, we're gonna be, you're gonna be able to register、uh, to be one of the select few that we pull in to early access. You better take them out. I see you guys moving. So here we go. I'm gonna pop up the URL. Let's go ahead and show it. This is fun for me because I get to take a picture of you taking a picture of me. <laughs> the waves are awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Let's move on. Um, I know it wasn't enough time, but many of you actually took a picture of the URL, which is awesome.、Um, that's just, you know, the start. So if you guys have any questions, or if you didn't get time to register, just stop by the booth. I've given you a window into the way that QuickBooks is working to help you grow your practice and scale your impact through our expert platform. Please do stop by the booth for more details and to meet a handful of the crazy, crazy bright, crazy passionate people. That I have the really good fortune to work with at Intuit, who are building these experiences just for you. Please connect with us. Tell us what you think, and tell us what you want to see next. And together, we can own the future. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage trend forecaster and author Michael McQueen. Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome. It's good to be here. Good morning, or as we say back home where I'm from, g'day. Some of you got it. Well done. Let's chat our inner Aussies this morning. Only count of three. I want to hear four thousand non-Australians do their best version of g'day. Okay, one, two, three. Well done. As we would say back home, that was bloody great. Well done, all of you. It is wonderful to be here. Thank you, Arise, and the rest of the QuickBooks crew for the invitation to have just a few minutes with you this morning to speak to the very theme, the core. Of this whole event, this whole notion of the future. What is the future going to hold? How do we make sure that we are ready for it, so that you can own the future? Now, before we start, can I see a show of hands? How many of you here have ever endured a boring or irrelevant presentation at a conference before? Hands up if you've experienced that. Almost all of you. Okay. Second question. To be honest, hands up if you're the one delivering that boring or irrelevant presentation at the time. There's a few of you. I love the honesty. My commitment to you is the few minutes we have together this morning will be neither of those two things: boring, nor irrelevant. It's going to be a few things: practical. It's going to be honest. Let's speak directly to what we are facing. Okay, not just dance around themes, but it's going to be a bit of fun. I think because fun is often underrated at most conferences. So, just to get our heads in the zone to think about the future, I want to have a bit of fun with you this morning. We're going to play a quick game together. We have a game that we're going to call. Future trends trivia. Now, who loves a bit of trivia here this morning? Any trivia buffs? You'll be well placed for this. I、so、turn your attention to the screens. Here's the trivia question I want to ask you this morning: What will Amazon's Alexa soon be able to predict with over 75% accuracy? Four options. Is it going to be A. Share market trends, financial modelling. Will it be B. Disease outbreaks. Will it be C. Marriage breakdowns. Or will it be D. The almost impossible, seemingly impossible, <laughs> Donald Trump's tweets. Okay, so I want to give you ten seconds. Compare notes to the person next to you. Which of these is it? A, B, C, or D? There is your countdown. Seven seconds to go. A, B, C, or D? All right, there's your buzzer. Okay, let's do a bit of a vote. Who's going to vote for A? Who thinks share market trends, financial modelling, lots of A's, even some applause? There you go. Who thinks disease outbreaks? Quite a few. Interesting. Who's, who's going to go for C? Marriage breakdowns. Look at that. All right, and who are the real optimists? Who thinks she'll be able to predict Donald Trump's tweets? Anyone? Look at that. I love it. Okay. Now here's what's interesting. The correct answer. This might surprise some of you. Is actually, if you look up on the screens, actually C. Marriage. <laughs> Breakdowns, which is interesting, because hey, we are almost at a point where Alexa will know before one of the parties in a marriage knows that things are on the rocks. Okay, now who has a smart speaker at home right now? Hands up if you do. Lots of you do. Can I urge you? You may want to speak more carefully. Okay, because I mean, how does Alexa know? Because she's listening not just to the, the the content of your conversations, but the tone you are using as well. So be careful what you say around your smart speakers. Lest you begin getting ads on Facebook for divorce lawyers, because 
that gets awkward at that point, right there. Um, now, this whole theme of predicting the future is something I've done now for a lot of years. I've been in this space for about 16 years, trying to essentially forecast where is the world heading from a demographic perspective, from the perspective of technology and some, some of the, the social trends we must pay attention to. And while studying the future is innately interesting, what I find most fascinating about looking at the future is examining and researching how, how brands and businesses navigate disruption and change. For instance, why is it that some businesses emerge from times of disruption stronger as a result of the experience, while many of their counterparts get wiped out by disruption? In fact, looking at that second group, I mean, just have a look at this little montage on the screen of brands that have had a really tough last few years. Many of these brands on the screen have actually filed for bankruptcy over the last few years. We've seen some notable ones join this list just recently in Thomas Cook Travel and Forever 21. Now, I mean, one that always stands out to me, though, on this list is in the top right-hand corner. That's, of course, the brand of BlackBerry. Now, I should check before we talk about them. Are there any BlackBerry users in our midst still here this morning? Oh, I've still got a BlackBerry phone? Because there's normally a few. Like, because I was at a conference last week with a whole lot of market analysts, and two of them had Blackberries. And I was like, I said, can I have a photo at lunch with you? Because this might be the last time I see one in the wild. You know, because, I mean, <laughs> they're still out there, but not many of them still left. Now, who has, at some point, had a Blackberry phone? Hands up if you have. Okay, most of us have. So, you look at them as a brand, January 2010, here in the US, 43% market share. You fast forward three years, and it was just over... 3% market share. But that is how quickly you can lose relevance, lose your edge if you are not careful. And while it's valuable to look at this question of how have other businesses navigated disruption poorly to try and learn from their experience, the far more important theme for all of us this morning is what is coming over the next five to 10 years that we can't afford to be caught off guard by? And a colleague of mine put it really well recently, another futurist by the name of Anders Sorman Nielsen put it beautifully when he said this. He said, the pace of change has never been this fast, but strap in. Like, it is never again going to be as slow as it is today. And we could spend a couple of hours this morning just looking at some of the technology that will shape the next few years. Everything from quantum computing to nanotechnology, certainly anything to do with AI and machine learning, which we've heard about from Arij. We could look at, I mean, just driverless cars. I mean, here we are, of course, in the home of driverless technology. Even yesterday, coming from the Apple campus back into downtown, past one of the Waymo cars doing the laps, being trialled. It's amazing how close that stuff is to becoming a reality. But I wanted to just focus on a couple of trends this morning that we need to make sure we are well aware of because of the way they're going to impact consumer behaviour and the way they're going to impact us in the area of professional services, particularly in the accounting space. Now, we already talked about Alexa, so let's start with Alexa very quickly. Because what's amazing about technology like what we see in Alexa and also Google Home is how younger generations are super comfortable with this technology. In fact, check this out. In the last 12 months, 43% of millennials have made a voice device purchase. Now, here's, how, here's why this is so significant. Up until 2018, okay, you look at the most common request on the Alexa platform, that year it was this. Hey, Alexa, can you buy me some batteries? People bark that order to the speaker at the corner of the room. Now, up until 2018, the number one selling battery brand in North America and globally was this one here. Last year, Duracell lost top spot. Any guesses which battery brand may have overtaken top spot last year? Amazon's very own brand of batteries. This is a significant moment. A moment where we see whoever controls the customer interface and the customer data has a power we've never seen before to even warp and distort consumer preferences and behaviour. Now, if you think about something that'll have an impact on certainly the professional services space, I wanted to highlight one technology that I don't know if many of you have heard of, but if you haven't, I'd encourage you to Google this. It's pretty extraordinary stuff. It's a technology called Crystal Nose. Crystal Nose, you can see the spelling of it up in the URL at the top of the screen there. Crystal Nose is absolutely amazing. In fact, um, to give you an idea of how this works, this is powerful if you're engaging with a new client, because if you want to get a sense of that client, their backstory, their background, you can actually plug their name into Crystal Nose. Using AI, it will scan the web and identify, based on everything that person has liked, shared, or followed, I know, um, basically the way you should approach that new client or that individual. 
Now, interestingly, last week I was working with a group of financial advisors, and when we were talking about this technology, there were sort of two responses. The first group were like, that's awesome for being able to customise the way we engage with clients, to personalise the experience. Who's in that camp? Who thinks this is great for personalisation and customisation? Who thinks this is awesome from that perspective? There's about 10 of you. Awesome. Um, <laughs> the rest of the audience said, you know what? It just feels a bit creepy to me. Who's in the creepy camp, OK? Right, and here's what we need to be super careful of as we start to leverage these technologies. We need to be so careful that in using this technology, we don't pull at the fabric of one of the most important things for any business over the next five to ten years, particularly the professional services game. And there's something beginning with T. It's trust. In fact, the last 18 months, the bulk of my research has been looking at consumer sentiment trends. Where is the hearts and minds of our consumers, our clients, our marketplace heading? And I want to tell you, trust is one of the most important commodities we will all need to trade in over the next few years. And now I think the thing that's eroded trust the most over the last few years, and lots of things have done this, is the fact that we are increasingly in something that's often referred to as the age of transparency, where everyone knows everything. There is nowhere to hide anymore. And there's a lot of conjecture about when the age of transparency, a very significant form of the trends that we're going to see unravel over the next few years, when did this start? I would suggest this age of transparency kicked off on one particular day a few years ago. It was the 10th of April, 2017. That was not a very noteworthy day for any particular reason, except that that was the day a particular news story broke that shocked the world. Now, you may not remember the day, but I bet you remember the news story. And this is the news story here, up on the screens. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Look at what you did to him! Wow, it is the video taking the world by storm this morning. United Airlines is under fire. Travelers are up in arms after a passenger, as you see, was dragged off of that airplane after refusing to give up his seat on an overbooked flight. Now, I mean, how many of you remember that story really well? I mean, it was shocking, wasn't it? We saw photos like these, and this guy blood pouring out of his face. And I mean, here's the interesting thing. So I've got an office in Sydney and New York. So we're between Australia and the US a lot. And I mean, you guys here in the States, you overbook flights often. This has gone on for years, OK? Far more than pretty much anywhere else in the world, I'll tell you, OK? So this has gone on for years. What was different this time, apart from how effectively United clearly beat up their passenger, apart from that, what was significantly different? Two words. Facebook Live. It had only launched three weeks earlier. And as this scene unfolded, Rather than just taking photos and videos, hey, we've done that for years, people broadcast this to the world in real time in app. That was the game-changing moment. In fact, within a few hours, United share price plummeted. Within a day, there was the call for the CEO's scalp. We wanted him to resign. And when this got into the social media arena, it took some pretty comical twists and turns. I love some of the memes that popped up in the days that followed. You may have seen a couple of these. I love these. We put the hospital in hospitality, which is brilliant. Um, my favourite meme by far, though, is this one here. The new cabin class on United flights. It's like, who comes up with this stuff? You know, and even some of their competitors got in on the game as well. So, love this, Southwest Airlines launched this campaign the next day, which is just <laughs> brilliant on their part. And um, these are the moments, isn't it? Where a reputation can be in tatters in a moment because you're in an age of transparency where everyone's got a voice. Now, hey, conventional wisdom tells us the customer is always right. We're told that. How many of you know in your heart of hearts the customer is fundamentally always right? Who knows that to be true? <laughs> Seven or eight of you, isn't that great? Okay, how many of you have a hunch the customer is often ill-informed and sometimes downright unhinged? Who knows that to be true? Come on. <laughs> right. And this is the challenge. We're in an environment where those customers, those clients have got a voice we've never seen before that is so powerful. I mean, just look at review sites for examples of this. I love this review on TripAdvisor. <laughs> You're like, you know, and hey, it's easy to laugh at this stuff, but here's the reality. We cannot afford to ignore this, right? Here's why. Have a look at some of the headline trend data, which is so important for all of us this morning. 86% of consumers say will regularly read an online review before engaging with a new product or service or service provider. Before engaging with a bookkeeper or an accountant, they want to see what do other people like me say about this person. Check this out here. 84% will trust online reviews 
as much as, if not more, than the review from a friend or a family member. This is like the new era of word of mouth advertising. Now check this out here, 89% of customers today want to see how you respond when the marketplace speaks. Here's the key theme. When the marketplace uses this very powerful voice, how do you respond? Because you need to respond. I mean, right now, you've got reviews being written about you. They're on social media, they're on review sites. Are you engaged in the conversation? Do you even know what is being said about you? Because this is where the game of trust is being won or lost, and many of us aren't even involved in the game. Now, a technology I'd recommend you look at, and there's a few you can look at in this regard. One is called BuzzHandle. Another one is called Mention.com. The beauty of these, if you want to check these out, is they allow you to set up almost like a Google alert for any time your name or your company, your firm name is mentioned on review sites or social media, so you can keep a tab on that, but also so you can respond. Now, here's a quick rule of thumb. Respond once and then stop. Here's why I say once and then stop. You know, if you probably figured out, a lot of reviews you see online, this is just the, the faintest whiff of crazy about them, okay? And nothing good ever comes from engaging back and forth with crazy people online. So just one response, a response like, hey, really sorry that happened, that's great feedback, and I'll learn from that and then leave it there, because it shows you're responsive. Now, as we said, we could spend a lot more time talking about some of the trends that are coming, but I want to shift gears in a few moments and look at this question of how do we gear up for the changes and the disruptions that are coming, be they technological or social or consumer-driven trends. And I think some of the most interesting research to this end that I've come across in recent years is a thing called the Future Brand Index. Now, if you haven't heard of this, can I suggest jot this down, maybe check it out? Because what the Future Brand Index team do is they take PwC's top 100 brands globally and they reorder them based on not how big the businesses are in terms of revenue figures, but on how ready for the future each of the businesses is. And if you look at the most recent data set, this is what it looks like. The brands near the top of the list are the brands that are ready for the future and for disruption. Those near the bottom, less so. And there are some surprises we'll pick out in a couple of moments here. But when this data set was most recently released, I looked at the top two categories, and I realised that I've probably worked with about half of the brands in the top two categories in the last 18 months. So I've had the chance to look behind the curtain. What are they doing differently? What's the culture they're building? What's the, what are the questions their leaders are asking? And I want to spend the next few minutes, the remaining minutes we've got together, looking at three things that all of those future-ready businesses are doing that I think we can all learn from this morning. And the first, if you want to write these down, and maybe grab out something to write some notes with, because we're going to move pretty fast here. First thing all these future-ready brands are doing is when it comes to strategy and innovation, they are thinking revolution, not evolution. There is a significant difference between these two things. And the trap we often fall into if we're not careful is we get so stuck on thinking about innovation as an evolutionary process, an exercise in continuous improvement. And there's a place for that. But can I suggest if that's all you're doing, it ain't going to cut it. I love this insight from a guy who used to head up the business faculty at San Francisco University, just up the road from us here this morning. Oren Harari was famous for saying, remember, the electric light never came from the continuous improvement of candles. Isn't that great? I love that, because it's true. It didn't matter how good you got at making candles, how long the light lasted, how pure the light was, there came a point where a fundamental, revolutionary rethink in how we made light needed to occur. This is the point where so many industries and brands are at right now. We look in the accounting space, and you know as well as I have, there's been lots of discussions in recent years, and, you know, will accountants and bookkeepers disappear because of technology? The short answer is no, if. And this ties in with what Areed shared so beautifully before. It's the powerful combination of software and automation with human skill and judgment. That's the power combo. And so what this means is actually rethinking the value proposition, the way the industry operates. You know, the best way I've put this in working with accounting firms over the last couple of years is you know, a revolutionary rethink of seeing the accountant as the scorekeeper at the end of the match to being the coach on the sidelines throughout the game. And that is a shift in the way you value what you offer your business model, the way you charge clients. And this is hard. And if we look at why being revolutionary is so difficult for most businesses and organisations, it's because, hey, we just get too close to our businesses. Most of us struggle to be revolutionary because we don't know what we are doing. And it's not that we're incompetent, it's that we're, there, that we're not cognizant of what we're doing every single day. I love this insight from a lecturer at Harvard and the business faculty. Habitual thinking is the enemy 
of innovation. Just going through the motions, doing things time after time the same way because that's just the way it's always been done. Now, can I suggest to you the best asset you've got in any team for revolutionary thought is the person on that team with the freshest eyes. It may be the person you hired last week, brand new to the business, doesn't know how it's always been does, isn't caught in habitual thinking yet, has no trouble thinking outside the box because they don't even know what the box looks like at this point. My question for you, though, is this. What is your cultural response to fresh eyes? When people with fresh eyes come into the business and say, why do you do it that way? Or, hey, why do you do it at all? The two most important revolution questions. How do you respond? You know how most businesses, most leaders respond? We basically say, sit in the corner. Watch how we do things around here. Once you know how we do things then and only then, can you offer some suggestions? Hey, by that point, they've got the same blink as the rest of us do. They're in habitual thinking mode again, and revolution is unlikely to come from that person. Now, speaking of the power of thinking outside the box when you've got fresh eyes, I love this student's exam response up on the screen here. And, um, School teachers will tell you, this is not called fresh eyes, it's called smart ass, okay? But it does somewhat make the point, okay? The power of just thinking differently. That's where revolution comes from. All right, number two, second thing, if we're going to gear up for disruption, is we need to have a ruthless focus on friction. Now, what is friction? Friction is the stuff that makes it difficult for people to do business with you. Friction is the stuff that adds complexity, frustration, confusion, jargon, okay? Much like the barnacles in the hull of a boat, that the longer the boat's in the water, the more those barnacles will form and slow down the boat, make it less efficient. Friction in a business setting is exactly the same. It's the stuff that over time just gradually builds up, and here's the problem with it, it impacts the customer experience. Now, here's one of the key messages I want you to take away this morning. The friction you are unwilling to address in your business, the stuff that is irritating your customers right now that makes life hard for them, if you don't address it, you leave yourself wide open to disruption. Because a new player will come in, a startup will come in and go, okay, well, if all the big guys don't care about this, we'll deal with it. We'll make it easy for the customer, and then you're in catch-up mode. I think the best example I've come across of this principle in action is the example of this company here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with TransferWise. Who knows TransferWise as a business? Hands up, only a few of you. I've checked this company out. They're extraordinary. Okay? I only used them again a few weeks ago myself. Just a brilliant company. What's interesting about TransferWise is the genesis story of this company. So the two founders were actually two of the early employees at Skype. Years ago, they were posted from Skype's head office in Estonia to London to open up the UK market. They arrive in London, very quickly encounter the frustration that every expat in history has encountered, which is how do I get my pay packet transferred from where I used to live and work to where I'm now living and working? Every month, they had to ring up their bank in Estonia, organise a physical wire transfer, it took days for the cash to turn up, cost a fortune in fees, they got a rubbish exchange rate. And a few months in, they're like, what is the deal with this? In this day and age, why is it still so hard to transfer money from one country to another. Who's ever asked themselves that question? I know I have many, many, many times. So, okay, they're technologists. They thought, okay, if we were to solve this problem to make it easier, what would we do? The answer was this company here, TransferWise. To put it very simply, this is a cloud-based peer-to-peer transaction platform. So let's say I've got Aussie dollars, you've got US dollars, I want US, maybe for some reason you might want Australian dollars. It's worth not much at the moment, so I don't know why you would want Aussie dollars, but let's say you did. We could actually swap them in real time on the app. And I mean pretty much real time, with hardly any fees, and at a better exchange rate than any of the other providers will offer. I mean, it's extraordinary. And they've been so thoroughly disruptive. I was working with one of the banks recently, and during the lunch break, one of the guys I was speaking to said, you know what, you're spot on about this whole transfer-wise thing. We are already talking in the bank about getting out of currency transactions, getting out of that part of the business, because we just can't compete with transfer-wise anymore. Now, just let this thought play out for a moment. The banks could have built TransferWise themselves, but they didn't. Now, we could talk about why they didn't, probably a lack of fresh eyes, probably the very friction that was irritating us, they were loving because it was a revenue source for them. And what's the lesson we can learn from that? When you don't focus on the friction that makes life hard for customers, you leave yourself open for someone else to do it for you. All right, the third and final key if we're going to gear up for change and disruption is this. We need to Foster healthy paranoia. Andy Grove, when he was at the helm of Intel, put it best when he said, only the paranoid survive. 
and it's true. There is something so powerful about going to every day, every client interaction, imagine you've got a target painted on your back. Imagine you've got people out to disrupt you. Because here's the beauty of that sort of perspective, that sort of mindset. It, it tends to engender the two most important attitudes or postures for agility. And they both start with H, if you want to write these down. Hunger and humility. The moment you lose those two things, that's the danger zone. Because what's the opposite of hunger and humility? Complacency and arrogance. Now, we don't call it arrogance. I mean, how often do we speak to someone, how are things going? I just feel like I'm really working on my arrogance lately. It's going great, you know? Now, you know what we often call arrogance? We call it experience. And it's often the same thing if we're not careful. So the old saying is true. The moment you think you've made it, you've passed it. We can never get to the point where we think we've arrived, we've got the winning formula. And the beauty of healthy paranoia is it always keeps you on your A game. What do I need to learn? How do I need to grow? How do I need to change? Always looking for the next thing. Now, I think, interestingly, the best example of a business that has kept healthy paranoia at the core of their company, even though they've done a lot of other things really wrong over the last few years, based just up the road from us here this morning, and that is Facebook. I think Facebook have done a phenomenal job of keeping healthy paranoia a key part of their business. Now, a few years ago, Facebook passed a significant milestone in terms of daily active users. And to celebrate the milestone, they did something surprising that shocked all the market commentators. What they did was this. They printed, like this is for a digital company, they printed tens of thousands of these little red books, like old school printed paper books, and distributed them to all of their staff. Now, for months, these were a closely guarded secret, the contents of this book. All we knew is this book contained the values, the DNA that had made Facebook successful. They wanted to codify this on paper. Now, a few months after this book was handed out, I managed to get my hands on a copy and get a sense of what was inside. My favourite page by far was this one here. If we don't create the thing that kills Facebook, someone else will. This is like a dictionary definition of healthy paranoia right there. Now, can you imagine every day going into work, into the office with that sort of thought? If today I don't do something that helps essentially kill off or erode what we've always done that's worked, someone else will do it for us? That's, that's uncomfortable, but it is absolutely necessary if you're going to be in the right position or posture to respond or to preempt disruption. I love this too because it reminds us of one of Steve Jobs' most famous quotes. Steve Jobs was famous for saying, if you are not willing to cannibalise your own business, someone else will do it for you and they will never do it with your best interests in mind. And so this is the challenge we've got, either disrupt yourself or you leave yourself very open to someone else doing it on your behalf. All right, we are almost out of time. What I will do before we finish up, I'll just pop my details up on the screen. Look, feel free to have a look at the website, a whole pile of things that could be useful up there. There's a whole video channel on the website with just short clips that build on a lot of the things we've talked about. So if you've got team members who weren't here, if you want to share some of that video content, by all means, if that would be useful, feel free to do so. Um, so feel free to have a look at that or reach out on LinkedIn or whatever works for you. But I was thinking of the best way for us to draw this session to a close. And the best way for us to do this would be to finish with a quote. And what I love about this particular quote is that it is 2,600 years old. Well, that's, that's old, right, by anyone's standards. But I reckon this quote is more relevant today than ever. And it's a quote from the great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu who put it beautifully when he said this. He said, resisting change is a, a little bit like trying to hold your breath. Even if you are successful, it is not going to end well, all right? And that would be my simple encouragement to you. There's a lot changing. A lot of this change you wouldn't choose. It's not convenient, but it's going to happen anyway. Our choice is how we respond. So thank you so much for having me. I hope that was useful. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks so much. Great work. Man, that was riveting. I really enjoy hearing Michael speak. I think of all the quotes that he shared, the one that's landing with me most is, the pace of change has never been this fast, but it will never again be this slow. I know you're ready for it, and here's one way I do know that you're ready for it. Over 800 of you have already signed up for early access for the experiences that I've shown you earlier. So thank you. That's right. 
I really hope you enjoy the next few days at QuickBooks Connect. We have a ton of amazing content ready for you. I hope you enjoy the sessions. I hope you connect with us at the booth. Welcome one last time. Please enjoy your day. Thank you.